place where we have not had food or water and electricity and all we had was Jesus and he was more than enough I had a broken guitar that made my fingers bleed when I led worship and I didn't care we sang the same song every day but it was a new song a joyful noise to him every day and all we had was love for Jesus and that's enough I'm telling you man you might not have money to keep the lights on in your house but if you have love for Jesus that's enough I know where I came from and where I'm going but you do not know where you've come from or where you're going wow 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 okay 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 this needs to give you goosebumps okay because there's no person in the existence of the universe that can make this claim Buddha did not know how he's gonna die Sri Sri Ravi Shankar did not know how he was gonna die all these pastors, evangelists, popes, theologians have no idea how they're going to die. Their divine destiny is not in their hands. There's only one person in the existence of the world that was able to stand boldly and say, I know where I've come from. I know where I'm going. I know my divine origin. I know my divine purpose. And I know my divine destiny. And that's why it's such a beautiful thing if you're a believer to say, Jesus Christ, He is my living hope. and you still do not know me whoever has seen me Philip has seen the father how can you say show us the father do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me the words that I say to you I, I do not speak on my own authority but the father who dwells in me does his works believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me and then he says Philip if that's too much for you to digest man at least believe on the account of the works themselves. If that's too much for your theology, and I want to tell you this morning, if it's too much for you to be able to pack that Jesus is God, at least look at his works. And I would say look at his works of him being brutally murdered on that cross and then stuffed into a tomb. And then on the third day, the tombstone rolls away because death could not hold him down. There was an empty tomb. At least for that sake, would your heart leap for joy and say, and his word that he says is true, says that he died for me so that my sin was put in that tomb and out comes righteousness that is mine today? At least on that account, you have to pay a little closer attention and say, maybe I can't do this life on my own. Maybe I need to take my righteousness, which is sinful, and dump it in that tomb. And then embrace all that Jesus has for me and walk out in the way. Isn't that what the Bible says? That the same power that raised Yeshua from the grave now lives in who? That lives in who? That lives in who? It's got to live in a believer's life. But how will you walk in power and authority if you've not validated the claims of Jesus? You know, man, when you go out in this world, 
there's going to be battles that you got to fight that your wisdom your intellect your experience your righteousness your muscles how much you can bench press is not going to mean a thing there's going to be battles that you cannot even see i'm not talking about a virus there's going to be darkness that can be felt and if this is the living church i want to make sure that we have the light of life i don't want to make sure that we're familiar with the light of life i want to make sure that we've validated its claims so we know without a certain without a shadow of a doubt that when darkness comes in like a flood that he will raise a standard by his blood and that you can walk in the power and the authority that his word which is true says that we can walk in there are people who lie about God's word the people that have distorted God's word there are people that have demeaned God's word there are people that have gone against God's word there are billion people who will say no Jesus never said that he is God but it does not change the fact that God's word is true let every man be a liar but let God be true it doesn't change the fact that God's word is true man what a beautiful thing for you to rest under in a world full of lies turn on your phone it's full of lies turn on your TV it's full of lies and many times you go listen to preachers it's full of lies where do we go praise god i get to go to god's word which is true loves to be verified by his creation we have a god who says i'm word i still communicate we have a god who says it's good for you that i go because then i'm going to send you the holy ghost and he's been with you but he'll be in you and he will teach you all things that i've been telling you he will bring to your memory the things that i've i've, I've told you and his spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are children of god i wish i had a church that was full of children of god whose spirit is bearing witness with his spirit that you are born again it's beautiful that you have a god who doesn't walk you through this life with uncertainty i was riding one of my old motorcycles in the dark last night and man i was like i got to be careful because it's so dim and it's so dark and there's no street lights in this place where i was riding in and my wife said yeah it's an old bike huh i said yeah yeah it's an old bike and it made me think of people who said that they've been christians for 30 40 years you walking in old light you walking in a dim bulb your bulb is your own righteousness your own works because you were saved at a billy graham crusade you think you're going to cut the line to heaven church i love you but you need to verify the claims of yeshua chance that you say that you're a christian that you're a believer but not once have you asked to understand what it means when jesus says i am the bread of life i am the savior of the world i am the true light that shines in the darkness if anyone follows me he will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life it's possible that you've not had a curiosity a joy a relentless pursuit of finding out am i walking in darkness or am i walking in light and it's quite possible that that's why your christianity feels so shallow and dead and you're able to sleep in and the government says turn your clocks ahead and then your whole life is just dozing off as keith print says you're asleep in the light
I'm from India, I don't know if you can tell. And in India, we have a very different worldview when it comes to God. In fact, we have gods, we have plural. In fact, we say anybody can be, be a God. It's kind of like Mormonism, really, okay? Mormonism, Hinduism for white people, okay? I don't care, fire me, big deal. Where I come from, we don't have, we have reverence for gods, for deity, but we, this kind of saying, I am the light of the world, it's a common saying. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar will say that. I mean, there you was a, a, to be a church. The Beatles. Yeah, good, good, good. I'm glad. You know, this week my wife and I were talking about how if we were only doing this once a year, like imagine you only had church once a year, okay? You would not want to miss it. <laughs> you know, but because we're doing it every week, you're like, yeah, I could sleep in today. I'll go play golf today, you know? Um, and who's that? Golf is golf. Yeah, but Jesus is God. So I don't know about that. And, and sometimes I, I try my best to put it in words and how much we need to appreciate being able to come together. And, uh, and at times it breaks my heart that people don't see the value in being able to come and worship Jesus together. Because I think sometimes people think that we're just here to put on a performance or to entertain the crowd. But I know that those who've really been desperate and have found Jesus will not want to miss it. You know what I'm talking about? You'd not want to miss it. As you look at the world right now, we know that we're nearing a time when all your faith, all your religious beliefs is going to be stomped out. Like what happened with the disciples is going to happen to the disciples of 2022. And I really hope that when we come to worship, you're able to suck on the marrow as much as possible and get everything out of what God has for you. I mean, if I were to tell you that, man, God has something for you today, you would not want to leave those doors without getting what he has for you today. And when you come into his presence, expecting God will never send you back the way you came. Even if you're a Gentile, even if you're an unbeliever that's come over here with a searching heart, with a hungry heart, and he might turn to you and say, hey, listen, 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 I've come for the children of Israel, and you say, but even the children eat the crumbs that fall off the table, he'd be like, man, I've never heard such faith like this. There were two things that's always surprised Jesus, where there was a lack of faith when there should have been faith. He wakes up and tells the disciples, oh, you of little faith, how long have I been with you? And the second thing that surprised him was faith when there should not have been faith. He's like, wow, never have I seen such faith in all of Israel. And I want our worship to be full of faith no matter what you're walking through. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the faith that's able to say, silver and gold I have none, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And a crippled man who was born crippled is able to lump, lump, jump, scream, and praise God. And I'm glad that it happened outside the temple, not in the church. But I hope that we're not a crippled church, man, that's taking care of crippled people. But I want you to have a healing this morning, not just in your physical bodies, but, man, your spirit. I want to read this verse, and we're going to jump into our time of worship. You, you already experienced the move of God right now, aren't you, even before we struck a, struck a chord, right? Yeah. Yes, praise God. Now, check this out. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. His riches are great. His wisdom is great. His knowledge is great. And it's impossible for us to understand his decision and his ways. But just because you can't understand, don't stop yourself at being in awe of all that he is. You ready to worship this king? whose wisdom is unsearchable, the Bible says, but man, he's rich in mercy, he's rich in grace, he's rich in knowledge, and I pray that he'll be present over here. Let's worship. Would you please stand?
I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Sing Lord I come Lord I come I confess Bowing here I find my rest And without you And without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Your sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found is where Oh, 
You're my one defense. You're my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense. You're my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, great is our God. King.
You are the reason. 
Isn't it great to have the victorious king as our defense? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're seated in majesty, but you're interceding for us. You're seated in majesty, but you're representing us before the Father. You're seated in majesty, but you're destroying every accusation brought against your children. We thank you, God, that while you're seated in majesty, it represents, it shows us that you were a pleasing, acceptable sacrifice for our sin. We thank you, Jesus, even though you're seated in majesty, you're still concerned about your children that's here on this earth. And we thank you, God, that you become our defense, that you become our righteousness. We thank you. God, I pray that this morning as we grow in intimacy with you, that we would recognize our deep, deeper need for you. And let's cry out and say, God, I need you. I need you over my finances. I need you over my parenting. I need you over my leadership. I need you over my relationships. I need you over my mind, over my thoughts, over my emotions. I need you. And more than anything, God, I need you to be God over my sin. To, because nothing else can cover those sins. I need you. Be my righteousness. Be my one defense. God, come and have your way in this church. Prepare us, O oh Lord. Prepare us to die this morning. Prepare us to die and to meet you face to face. Prepare us this morning, O oh Lord, to get ready for that day when we would breathe our last and see you face to face. I pray that you would come and have your way in this place. God, work in ways that we never expected you to work. Speak to us in ways that we never thought that you would, we would hear you speak to us. Jesus, come and have your way. Come and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. So happy to see you guys. High five someone. Tell them to wake up. Tell them get ready for what God's going to do. And we'll get into some announcements in the Word here soon. We have a God who loves to be verified by His creation. We have a God who says, I am word, I still communicate. We have a God who says, it's good for you that I go because then I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost and He's been with you, but He'll be in you. And He will teach you all things that I've been telling you. He will bring to your memory the things that I've, I've, I've told you. And His Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are children of God. I wish I had a church that was full of children of God whose spirit is bearing witness with His Spirit that you are born again. It's beautiful that you have a God who doesn't walk you through this life with uncertainty. I was riding one of my old motorcycles in the dark last night and man, I was like, I gotta be careful because it's so dim and it's so dark and there's no street lights in this place where I was riding and my wife said, yeah, it's an old bike. Huh? I said, yeah, yeah, it's an old bike. And it made me think of people who said that they've been Christians for 30, 40 years. You're walking an old light? You're walking a dim bulb? Your bulb is your own righteousness, your own works because you were saved at a Billy Graham crusade. You think you're going to cut the line to heaven? Church, I love you. But you need to verify the claims of Yeshua. And in India, we have a very different worldview when it comes to God. In fact, we have gods, we have plural. In fact, we say anybody can be, be a God. It's kind of like Mormonism, really, okay? Mormonism, Hinduism for white people, okay? I don't care, fire me, big deal. Where I come from, we don't have, we have reverence for gods, for deity, but we, this kind of saying, I am the light of the world, it's a common saying. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar will say that. I mean, there was a guru that the Beatles traveled to India because he said he was a light. Where is he now? Candle in the wind. Right? Gone. So something like this, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, please listen to me. I really want to, I, I want to like scratch your curiosity. This for a person living in the North End, just sounds like some new age mumbo jumbo 
but to the people that Jesus is talking to this was a claim unlike any other this was him saying that he is God that he is the great I am that he is the pillar of fire that led their forefathers through the wilderness that he is the creator of heaven and earth he's not saying I'm just another new age guru and if we are believers who say that our hope is set on Jesus he's our living hope you need to take and pay close attention to his claims and you need to verify what he said to people plainly and then challenge them to verify the claims I come from a place where we have not had food or water and electricity and all we had was Jesus and he was more than enough. I had a broken guitar that made my fingers bleed when I led worship and I didn't care. We sang the same song every day but it was a new song, a joyful noise to him every day. And all we had was love for Jesus and that's enough I'm telling you man. You might not have money to keep the lights on in your house but if you have love for Jesus that's enough. Okay, um, first off, uh, welcome to the Living Church. I'm glad you guys are able to join us. I'm going to go ahead and pray for our offering. So if you call this church your home uh, and you give to it with your finances, I'm going to go ahead and pray for that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that we can uh, have a church body that we can call home here in Boise, God. And even I thank you that we're able to reach people even across the across the world, God. And if this is... Uh, their home, Lord, and they give to it, God. I want to I wanna say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the people that call this their home and that give to it, God. I ask that you bless every penny they give, Lord. I ask that they give it in faith, not out of, not out of obligation or out of guilt, but I ask that they do it excited for what you'll do with it, God. Lord, I ask that they're thankful for how you're moving, Lord, and ask that that's why they give. God, I ask that you bless it immensely. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, going to give you a couple uh, kind of updates. Uh, Joel, what he kind of wanted me to do this morning is not tell you what we're going to be doing, but give you an overview of what we have done over the last five years at the Living Church Boise. And this is to get you excited about what God has done, to then get you excited about what God will do. Amen. You ready for that? Yes. If you're at home, say yes too. Okay, so first off, about... Three or four years ago, we're in our fifth year right now, so I'm going to wind back about three or four years ago. And in terms of what we have done, I'm the media guy over here, so we're going to do media topics this morning. Next week, someone else will do something, I'm sure. But this week, I want to talk about media specifically. So about three or four-ish years ago, uh, Joel uh, felt called to... Um, not plant the church, this is a little bit later. He felt called to uh, invest the church's resources into a website and an app. And the kind of the idea is not just preaching and having teaching for people in a building, but to, in the grand scheme of things, reach people all around the world and be able to reach you guys every single day of the week. And so we invested in the software and we, we owned it for a while before we were actually able to start using it uh, until someone was able to come along and kind of use the software and build anything. That, that person was me. And so I came along, and then uh, God's like, hey, I want you to get this done. So I spent day and night, day and night, it's a song. I spent day and night uh, trying to really put this together. And as soon as the app launched, literally a week later, COVID happened, and everything went online. And... Uh, 
One person's happy, woo, COVID happened. And then uh, people are able to watch live on the app. They're able to get daily meditations on the app every single day to encourage them when everyone was at home, alone, isolated, maybe depressed. Maybe, yeah, maybe you were, I don't know. Anyways, daily encouragement. So, and so uh, three years later, uh, here are the numbers for that of what we've gone through in three years. So media plays wise, we've had over 15,000 media views through our app and our website. We have almost 1,300 downloads. One more to go if you're at home and you haven't done it, or if you're in here, get us to 1,300. Uh, 25,000 launches and over 200,000 uh, clicks within the app. So people clicking on different things. That could be for discussion questions, daily meditations, sermons. So that's pretty exciting, right? Yeah, yeah okay, cool. So three years. So again, we're talking about what God has done over the last three years, the last four years uh, in the church media-wise. And so this is just the first thing. So this was three years ago we got this going. It's still going today, and it's really encouraging for people to be able to get these daily meditations, these sermons out each week. The second thing uh, that media-wise that we've been doing consistently is about six months ago or so, we started getting on social media a lot more. So this would be through TikTok. And on TikTok, we... Uh, we put up around like 15 to 20 videos a week. So we're putting out 15 to 20 videos a week. And really the idea is to get the, the gospel out to the whole world. That's kind of what we're called to do. And it looks different for us today because we have social media. And so we started this about six months ago and we'll put up the numbers for that right here. Uh, over the last seven days alone, we've had over 200,000 views. This is two days old, but 200,000 views and a lot of like over a thousand comments at this point now. And then over the last 60 days, uh, we've had, or the, yeah, the last 60 days, one and a half million views for these messages. Uh, it's not a views game, but to say that we've been able to reach hundreds of thousands of people, over a hundred thousand every single week through what's been preached through this very small church in Boise, Idaho. So, I mean, that should be encouraging alone, yeah. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting it. And then uh, followers-wise, uh, in the next slide. So we have, right now we have over 92,000 followers on TikTok. And uh, the countries, so only 49% are from the U.S. So that should be really exciting, which means 51% are from the rest of the world. Uh, in South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria. Uh, we have a lot of people from the Caribbean, Canada, the U.K., Ireland, all across the world, people are getting the gospel, being encouraged every single day through daily meditations and through little excerpts from the sermon. So again, really, really cool that we're able to, like, if you're partnering with this church, you should be really excited because I don't know if you could have ever imagined uh, a check a month could do anything like this, you know? And so it's not, not to get you to give more money, but to say like, what you give goes a long ways that you probably didn't realize before today. All right, uh, the th next thing we did is uh, just recently, just a couple months ago, we went on to Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts uh, with just putting the messages up audio-wise. We just did that a couple months ago. And uh, I'll show you the numbers again here. So just over the last couple months through both Spotify and uh, Apple combined, we have over 8,000 just listens, uh, and which is another way to get the message is just a lot of people like to listen to it rather than video-wise. And I'll hurry this up a little bit. Uh, yeah, again, this is, again, we're just, I want to encourage you on how consistent we're being with our media, how consistent. Over the years, a vision four years ago is building. It's still building. We're not being stagnant in anything. We're always trying to grow and adapt and reach new people. Uh, the final thing is YouTube. So YouTube has grown a lot. Over the last uh, three months or so, we've gained over 1,000 subscribers. Uh, and... For me, I'm a, I'm a video guy specifically. Audio's cool, and a lot of people like audio. Good for them. Uh, I actually like audio, too. That's how I listen, ironically. But uh, video is something I'm really passionate about. And what I decided to do is every single Sunday, we don't just put up this live message. We actually are putting, I actually go through every Monday, and I re-edit the entire message. And the mindset behind that is that if, if Joel is spending all week to prepare this message, I wanna create a video that actually resembles that. And so every week we put up a fully edited message, uh, really clean cuts. If you go and watch it, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate it a little more. 
Probably not. But here are the numbers for that. Um, just in the last uh, 90 days, we've had over 21,000 views through YouTube. We actually got monetized. So if you're annoyed at the commercials beforehand, no. gives us extra money. So, <laughs> but uh, just, uh, just in these last couple of weeks, we also put our daily meditations on here too. So video daily meditations are on YouTube. We have our sermons on there and we have our, our live stream on there. So if you're at home, uh, and you're not satisfied with the video switching, uh, you can go and watch it tomorrow and it'll be nicely edited. But Kira does a good job, so that shouldn't be an issue. That's all I have for you. Uh, I want us to, again, be encouraged about what God has been doing over these last five years to encourage you on what he'll be doing in the upcoming years. So, yeah. Good job, man. A lot of churches are very jealous that I have a Levi. Every church needs a Levi, and they're like, man, like how much do you pay this guy? Not enough. You know, and you need to know that Levi's not doing this because of his paycheck, neither am I doing this because of a paycheck. It's, I believe firmly that God's work done God's way will not lack God's supplies. <laughs> when I, I was telling George this earlier, when we sing, how great is our God, and all the world will see how great is our God, Earlier, when I was in India, I thought the idol worshippers will see how great our God is. But sometimes, especially in today's day and age, I need the people in the church to see how great the God is that we worship. You know, God's work done God's way will not lack God's supplies. Some preacher said it. I didn't, I didn't make that up. But it stuck with me. And I'm sorry if it's you who said it. Like, thank you for writing that. Because it's very, very, very true. Um, you know, I'm amazed at what God is able to do with people who are dedicated, devoted, and, um, and even when we don't understand what it is that God's calling us to do fully, when we do it in obedience, we begin to see the water turning into wine. You know, multiplication, multiplication, multiplication. Uh, many times when I preach messages like the broken blessing, it comes from what I'm seeing God doing in the behind the scenes over here. I'm really excited um, for what God is going to do. So many of you guys know that we've been praying for a building. And... Um, I know you're very eagerly praying and waiting to see what God will do. Just wait and see. God is good. He will do what he set out to do. Um, God's got this. God's got this, okay? Let me jump into the word real quick before we spend too much time um, getting excited about what God is going to do. Let's, let's look at this. What, are you guys ready for this? Okay, but before we jump in, man, I'm tired, man. We had, uh, <laughs> we had my brother's kids come and spend a week in our house. So we had eight kids in our house all week. And I know some of you are like, ah. Yeah, and my daughter had the audacity to say that she couldn't sleep because I was snoring too loud. <laughs> so I did the right thing a dad should do. I left the room, right? And I'm like, you take my bed, then I'll leave the room. No. It was crazy, but man, it was, it was beautiful, though. It was very life-giving. Yeah, I was telling uh, Greg earlier, you know, you know you're going to have a rough week when you wake up and the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning is like, man, I need a nap. You know, <laughs> It's bad. So uh, I pray that the rock star will help me and that the Holy Spirit will give me supernatural strength. Let's jump into God's word. Um, I don't know if you ever did this when you were playing as a kid or you, you know, hanging out with your family in the swimming pool. Uh, you have the contest to see who can hold your breath the longest underwater. You ever done that? Yeah, apparently... Um, the longest that you can stay underwater, okay, like just you go now and your willpower and you're like, I'm going to hold my breath underwater, you can stay underwater for 90 seconds, 9 zero, 90 seconds. But with training and some help from a hit of pure oxygen before you hold your breath, and with a lot of training, you can stay underwater for 24 minutes. Pretty impressive, right? And apparently that was the, that's the world record of a guy who um, was able to hold his breath underwater for 24 minutes um, after training and taking pure oxygen before he went underwater. But there was one guy who spent six days underwater. Six days underwater. Now, you know that he didn't do it in one breath. Okay. No, he came back alive. Some of you are like, yeah, he came up dead. No, no, no. He came back up alive. But he had oxygen tanks. He had scuba diving gear. He had a whole team to assist him. You know, in case he needed anything, and that's the world record for a guy to be underwater the longest was six days. Why is it so amazing when someone spends 24 minutes underwater with 
no you know scuba diving gear and then six days with all the gear and pure oxygen being shot out to him and a team at his back and called why is it so amazing it's because your world is not the water world you're not made to live underwater right and that's why it's so amazing when someone is able to go into that world and spend so much time over there it's unheard of we're like put it in the Guinness Book of World Records like, you know, this guy has been underwater the longest than any human being has, has and has come out alive. Now, if you're tracking with me, it should give you perspective to understand when the Bible says this world is not your home. Jesus says, I'm from above, you're from below. I am not of this world, you're of this world. When Jesus says that you're off this world, but this world is not your home, we then should not try to pile up on oxygen tanks, on goggles, and scuba diving gear to see how long we can spend over here. But instead, we got to plead the blood of Jesus and say, man, how can I not make this world my home and suffocate and die and find the home that's been created for me and prepare myself for that? Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 24, listen to this. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he you will die in your sins okay that verse should make you sit up and say wait wait wait, wait. Jesus is giving me a warning he's saying hey listen you're gonna die in your sins you're gonna die drowning in this world that you're trying to make your home unless what a beautiful word unless you're gonna choke and die, you're gonna drown and die, you're gonna die in the dark depths with the monsters all around you, unless. And that's what I'm getting my title for this morning's message is don't die like this. When Jesus gives you a warning, man, you gotta sit up, you gotta pay attention. I mean, warnings are scary to begin with. Don't feed the sharks, right? Don't stick your hand in over here. Jellyfish, when I was in Australia, jellyfish, don't go surfing over here. Sharks over here, and we're like, yeah, let's not go. Warnings are scary. I mean, sometimes you see warnings that are stupid, right? Caliente, coffee is too hot. You know, you'll burn your mouth. Okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> here we go. But when Jesus gives you a warning, it's way more serious than that. And especially when Jesus is talking about you will die in your sins. Multiple times in nine verses, Jesus is going to be talking about how these people are going to die and it's a warning for you and me to not die in the ways that these listeners of Jesus were willing to die he says don't die in your sins and then he says don't die in your arrogance and then he says don't die under judgment and church what I want to challenge you and me with is this are you ready to die and if you're ready to die is this how you want to die the way you are today is that how you want to die for the past few weeks, I feel like I've been preaching the same message and I'm going to do it again. Um, as believers, there's got to be a way we live. And oftentimes we get so carried away by the world and we start living like the world. We start trying to maneuver our way underwater. We start trying to enjoy the deep, dark, cold oceans of life instead of realizing that this world is not my home. And Jesus, prepare me for what you have in store for me. And I want to ask you, is this how you want to die? And I want to beg and plead with you, believers and unbelievers, please don't die like this because there's so much more left, so much more worth that God has deposited in you, created you with, that's worth you fighting for. So number one, let's look at this. We're going to be in John chapter 8 from verse 21 to 30. So if you have your Bibles, open, open it over there. And um, a few verses, but... I think very, very crucial verses. So number one, um, don't die in your sins. Very plain, very simple, very straightforward. Don't die in your sins. I'm so glad when you go down to Best Buy or Winco or whatever grocery store you are, you know, you have in your, in your country, you're not going to have a person doing a survey where they're being like, uh, so can I ask you a question? Are you ready to die? <laughs> you will have never shop in here again, right? My, what's in your cereal, man? But I'm so glad that in church, we get to ask this question. In fact, I think more pastors should be asking this question. 
are you ready to die? And if you're ready to die, man, are you going to be dying in your sins? You see, I've attended quite a few funerals. And quite a few of them, I've attended them as a pastor where I had to get up and say a few encouraging things. And sometimes people want pastors to kind of nudge their loved ones into heaven, right? I, I don't have the power to do that, man. Funerals, no matter how, you know, no matter what, the, what, what caused that death, it's always sorrowful, it's always sad, there's always tears. Some funerals are ones where we've been expecting, we knew it's coming, and the family members are prepared for it, and yet it's sorrowful and sad. And then there are some funerals that was just so unexpected. In fact, the very first memorial service that I did was for a baby, the very first one I did, as a young youth pastor, and it was it's heartbreaking. Death is always heartbreaking, but death is very real. And no matter how your death comes, one day you're going to find yourself in a coffin on people around you weeping, missing you, saying nice things about you. But before that day comes, the question that I really want to ask you, I want it to resound in your spirit, is, is this how you want to die? And if you're going to die, are you going to be dying in your sins? Do you want to die in your sins? Verse 21 in John chapter 8. Jesus said to them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Folks, is there a sense of urgency as you hear this verse? Is there a sense of your heart racing when you hear the red letter words of Jesus when he says, I'm going away, you will seek me, and you will die in your sins because where I'm going, you cannot come. There's going to be a sign that says, no entry. Sorry, sir, you cannot come in. You cannot enter in. And, and you might feel like, well, I don't really need to be where Jesus is. Imagine being away from your loved one for the rest of your life. The one that loves you the most. I don't know, grandma, mom, your wife, your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend. The one that you love the most being away. Man, it's multiplied. Multiply that by a million times. Being away from Jesus is being away from a person who actually understands you. Now, you might not have a relationship with Jesus, but you know what? You are so familiar with God because you're surrounded by His creation, and you yourself are His creation. And to be separated from God for eternity should be a nightmare for you. Now, I'm not trying to, to frighten you and to brainwash you. One comment, you know, it's like brainwashing at its finest. No, I'm not preaching this to brainwash you. I'm not preaching this for you to give me money. I'm preaching this because Jesus said... You will die in your sins. And you know what? I don't want to be a person that's giving you food boxes because I love people. I want to give the word, the bread of life yeah. that will prepare you to breathe your last with joy and celebration. Yeah. So you can say, wow, praise God, here I come like Stephen. Man, I see the face of Jesus and it's glowing, it's beautiful, he's coming for me. Is this how you want to die in your sins? Because to me, the thought of dying I'm being away from my loved ones. It, it kind of is like, man, I really hope that my children will not weep too much and not mourn too much and not miss me too much. And then when I have an eternal perspective of thinking that, man, I hope that God is not grieving over a sinner who had an opportunity for grace, who had an opportunity for forgiveness, who had an opportunity to be, be washed by the blood of the Lamb, but I walked away wearing my goggles and my scuba tank and making much of the world and collecting seashells that mean nothing. Hey man, can you take your babies outside? Sorry, man. And Jesus said, I'm going away. You will seek me. You will, you will look for me. Okay, I want to talk to those of you that have stopped fighting You've grown cold in your walk with God. Do you know that there will come a time when you get so cold that no matter what physical force tries to yank you into the kingdom of God, a pastor screaming and yelling and crying over you, your grandma fasting and praying over you, worship music being written exclusively for you, devotions written for you, will not bring you closer to Jesus. Even when you want to turn, you will not be able to turn. Esau sought repentance with tears, but he could not find it. Do you know there will come a time when you say, man, I, I know I need to change, but 
I just don't have the desire to go to church. And I pray by the mercy of God that there's someone at home right now that the Holy Spirit's like, man, at least watch this and maybe it'll wake you up because the Holy Spirit will keep on pursuing you and knocking after you and searching after you, but it's going to take your humility, your obedience to be like, God, I need you. Otherwise, you will die in your sin. Sin is so damaging. It'll give you false hope. It'll give you false strength. It'll give you false joy. Have you ever seen a drunk guy doing things that he normally wouldn't do when he wasn't drunk? You ever seen that? I've seen people drunk in India that blows my mind. I watched a video once of a guy jump into the cage of a lion when he was drunk, thinking that he could talk to the tiger, sorry, a tiger, thinking that he could talk to the tiger. Sin is like that. It'll give you false strength, false joy, and false hope. And for a time being, it's going to make you feel strong. As you pursue sin for a time being, it will give you pleasure. The Bible says its pleasure will, la- it, it, it will give you time, but it will not last. Because when you wake up in the morning, you see its venom dripping from its fangs. And then it's going to be too late for you. Is that how you want to die? Befriending sin. A loving sin to get strong. I told you a few weeks ago, sin is like a man that you begin to strengthen when you give it room in your life. The Apostle Paul, he reflects this same warning when he writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. I'm going to go through a few verses from 1 John chapter 3. Look at this. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, oftentimes in our modern evangelical churches, we oppose, we, 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 we try to fight law and grace. And we say, law is bad, grace is good. No, law is good. And grace is good. I was telling this to my kids yesterday. Soap and water is not your friend, and the mirror is not your enemy. If you have filth on your face, the mirror is not your enemy. Just because soap and water washes you, doesn't make soap and water better than the mirror. Without the mirror, you wouldn't appreciate the soap and water. In fact, you wouldn't even need the soap and water. Grace and the law are good. Your law is perfect. Your law is good. Your law is beautiful. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to keep the law. In fact, the more you look at the law, the more you see like, man, there's no way I could keep it. Thank God for soap and water. That's the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the anti-venom that's in his blood. So sin is lawlessness. So next time someone asks you, what is sin? Don't get all theological on them. Point them to 1 John Chapter 3, verse 4, and says, everyone who practices lawlessness is sinning. We'll unpack this a little bit more. Look at this. Then he says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Okay, now, now, now checkmate, man. If you think that, okay, I can't keep the law, man. So I know I practice lawlessness, We saw uh, Paul who says, wretched man that I am who will save me from this body of sin. I have to die as a person breaking the law. Here the apostle John writes, the Bible says that you know that he appeared to take away sins. In him there is no sin. So he's saying that you don't have to die in your sins. You don't have to die in your sins. Yes, you've broken the law. Yes, you constantly keep breaking the law. But you don't have to die in your sins because Jesus came to take away sins. And then he says, no one who abides in him in Jesus, keeps on sinning. If it's your own Bible, you've got to underline that. Keeps on sinning. That means you will sin, but you wouldn't keep on. Thank you. You will sin, but you would not keep on sinning. You will fail, but you will not keep on failing. You will fall, but you will not keep on falling. You will betray him, but you will not keep on betraying him. You will deny him, but you will not Because, listen to this, You will not keep on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Okay, there are so many influential pastors and preachers and people on social media who are full of lies, who will tell you it's okay because you have grace. Go on breaking the law. You have grace. Look at what the apostle writes about knowing what is to come. He says, little children, verse 7, let no one deceive you. 
Let no one deceive you so that you die in your sins. You don't have to die in your sins. Please don't be deceived. Yes, you've broken the law. Yes, we are lawbreakers. But praise God that we have Jesus who is sinless, who takes away your sin. But don't keep on breaking the law. Yes, you have an advocate. But don't keep on breaking the law. Because if you keep on sinning, you've never seen him and you don't know him and you have no love for him. And let no one deceive you saying that go on practicing sin, it's fine. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Does it mean that our salvation is of works? That means we have to keep practicing our, our, our good works so that we're saved. No, this is not, listen to me very carefully because I know I preach a lot of grace. I preach, if you're failing, fail in the church. It's okay for you to fail. If you fought on Monday, good for you. I'm proud of you. Jesus loves you. Keep on fighting. I keep saying that. This is not a salvation based on works. This is what it means. A person who's saved will be so excited to practice their salvation, to live out their salvation, to actually know what it means to wield the soul of the spirit, to know what it means to, to wear the breastplate of righteousness, to buckle up with the truth, to wear the shoes of, the, of peace, of the gospel of peace. A person who's truly saved will be excited to live out the Christian walk. You ever bought something new, like a guitar or a, many of you guys probably didn't buy a brand new guitar, but you bought something new that, that you've been excited to, you've been saving up for, you've been watching reviews, you've been excited to try it out. You don't buy it and just leave it in the garage. Man, I remember when I bought my guitar, I played all day long. Even till my fingers got numb. I, I buy a motorcycle, I ride it till my burn my neck. Right in 30 degree weather, I'm like, Ooh. it was like, ouch. <laughs> Put a hand warmer in my helmet to try to do something, you know? Felt like my fingers were being hit by a hammer, man. So cold. You do stuff like that when you, when you actually like something, when you're excited about something, when you're excited about Jesus. Hey, when you really take the promises of Jesus seriously, and you say, I'm going to fight temptation. Sin is lawlessness. I want to walk the way Jesus walked. I want to talk the way Jesus talked. I want to spend time in his word like the way he wanted us to. I want to be his true disciple. I want to be able to live for him, die for him. I don't care if people think I'm weird and crazy. I want to wear Jesus all over me. I want people to know that I belong to Jesus. I don't want to die in my sin. I want to die ready to see his glorious face. And that's what John is writing. He says, listen, don't let anyone deceive you, man. If you continue to practice your sinful deeds, you are not saved. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Oh my goodness. We have a lot of people belonging to the devil in the church and behind the pulpit. They're not fighting sin. In fact, they're practicing sin and making excuses for the church to practice sin. They have no right to confront sin in their own church because they themselves are in sin. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I like that one faint amen. What does that mean to you and me? What does that mean to you and me? Listen to me very carefully. I don't want you to die where you've made sinning a practice, I don't want you to die where you begin to function without a fight. Christians, there are many of us. How do I know this? Because I've been there, man. And I'm working my way out of this. Where I've learned to function without a fight. You just go on, lazy, I remember when I was saved and the Holy Spirit began to convict, convict me of certain habits of mine. And I would go to work knowing that the people that I hung out with are going to get me to doing the same things again. But I would still show up to work, still hang out with those same guys. And until one day the Holy Spirit said, hey man, when are you going to say enough is enough? When are you going to put up a fight? So you know what I did? I saved money for a few months. True story, saved money for a few months quit my job and stayed home till I could detox. Because a drug addiction is a real thing. And I can be a fully functioning drug addict. I can still show up to work high and still do my job 
and still get gold stars and get promotions because the world doesn't care about stuff like this as long as you make the money. In fact, like the drunk guy, I felt more confident to make sales. I felt more confident to be more outgoing. My, my, my social anxiety was gone when I was high. But the Holy Spirit's enough, enough. I want you to start depending on me, not on that. And so I sat at home for a whole month till I could detox from it. And yes, it was very lonely. And yes, it was hard. But believers, I want to ask you, have you learned to function without a fight? Because if you've learned to function without a fight, you're going to die in your sins. A person who's truly saved will not go on practicing sin, but will continuously practice righteousness. And even when they fail, they will fight and they will come back, not because our salvation is based on works, but a person who's saved would love to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. The Apostle John continues, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. Believers, you know how terrible it is when you sin? It's one of the most frightening things. <laughs> your friends will be like, that's all you did? And you're weeping and mourning and crying? What's wrong with you, man? I've done worse. And it's because they've not been in the light. You're sinning in the light and all your deeds are exposed and you're like, God, I can't keep doing this because you cannot keep on sinning because you've been born of God. His seed is in you. By this it's evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. So if you want to know, am I going to die in my sins? The apostle John's going to help you by saying, this is how we know who are the children of God, who are the children of the devil, who go on sinning and who don't. And he says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So church, I want to ask you, have you learned to function without a fight? A person who's been born again will have a fight against sin. In fact, I can tell you this out of experience, it gets exciting to fight against sin. Temptation is not scary anymore. Man, multiple times I've said this, you live differently when you're loved. You walk differently when you're loved. Your confidence is different when you're loved. When you know that Jesus loves you, when you know that he's forgiven you of your sins, when you know that his grace abounds, and you know that he's got your back, and you know that he's told you in every temptation, I've given you a way out, you're like, okay, God, you're not going to go look for temptation, but when it comes, you're not going to be frightened. You're going to say, I know that he's going to teach me through this. He's going to walk me through this, and I'm going to fight through this. And when you fought, and you fought, and you fought, and now and then you fail, praise God. The Apostle John writes, Brothers, children, I'm writing this to you so that you do not sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. And that's what we're saying, Oh God, how I need you. You're my, you're my righteousness, not my works. You're my one defense, not my works. My works is just because I love you. My works is because I want to walk the way you told me to walk. My works is because I want to be an obedient child to you, not to earn my salvation, not to earn my fa my, my, your favor, but this works is a natural outpouring of my relationship with you. You getting it? Yeah. Now I know that as I say this, uh, many of you are excited about this because you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, you're like, man, I've always wrestled with this. I, I do not know where do my works end and where does his works begin. Well, your works is not to earn your salvation. Your works is only out of obedience. Your works is, is a sign that you truly are saved, okay? Your works does not work your salvation. Your works is only a sign that you love him. Jesus goes on in John chapter 8, verse 24, he says, I told you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Look at this, unless, again, beautiful, joyful, unless. He's giving you a way out. If, you will die if you don't believe. Wow. You listen, folks. You don't have to die in your sins. There's a way out. And it begins with you believing in all that Jesus said that he is. Over here, it says, I am he. It's supposed to be, unless you believe I am, ego, ami in Greek, unless you believe I am, and he's talking about him being the great I am. I will talk about this next week. I don't want to get into this this week because Jesus in John chapter 8 talks a lot about how he is the great I am. But he says that unless you believe that Jesus is all that he claimed to be, you will die in your sins. It starts with belief. 
Jesus warns us, listen to this, he warns us like the apostle John, he warns us and he says in Mark chapter 13 verse 5, Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and they will lead many astray. Once again in Luke chapter 21 verse 7 and they asked him, teacher, when will these things be and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, see that you are not led astray for many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. Once again, what I warned you earlier, many will come. We're looking for the Antichrist, but those Antichrists will come with different messages telling you it's okay, continue in your sin. It's fine. It's not sin. In fact, so many pastors are there saying sin does not exist. Wow. They write books. They tell you, no, don't worry. Once you've, you know, come to the altar, you've given your life to Jesus, go on living the way you want. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like you bought your, what are the Catholics were selling? Something like that. You know, it's like you're saved, you're fine. Don't let anyone deceive you to tell you, go on practicing your sin. This morning, if you're hearing my voice in the areas where you've stopped fighting, don't be a Christian who's learned to function without a fight. And for those of you that are fighting, anybody been fighting really hard? You're excited, you're like, man, I'm so glad. In fact, Joel, this is exactly what God's been walking me through. I'm so encouraged to hear that there's an urgency in my heart that God's been bringing me through. There's a new fight that I've never had before. Well, Jesus has a word for you too. Number two, don't die in your arrogance. Because, you see, there were a few months in my life when I'd come to the conclusion that I was just a divine joke. I don't know if you've ever been there. You try and you try and you try and you try really hard. And you hear these Christians talk about, right, like me, you know, like you're sitting over here and you, someone like me talking about, like, fight your sins, you're going to die in your sins. And instead of being encouraged and enthusiastic to fight, you only get more depressed. And your shoulders begin to slop and you begin to go lower and lower and lower. And then by the time the pastor's praying, you just slip out the door. If that's you or you're sitting at home or you're over here, there was a time when I had rock bottom, man. And I concluded that I was just a divine joke. I concluded that I was placed in time to be ridiculed for eternity. You see, no amount of getting high could take me away from the knowledge that inherently is in every man, in all of mankind, that you're an eternal being. No matter what people tell you that when you die it's lights out, you watch those guys in their deathbed. They'll be crying out for God. Because every single person on earth knows that they're created for eternity. What do you do? What do you do when you try to fight really hard, but you just conclude that you're going to keep failing? And you conclude that God's put you on earth just to be a failure, a divine joke to be ridiculed for the rest of eternity. I don't know if you ever felt that way. It's a feeling of despair that magnifies every other failure in your life. Maybe I'm talking to someone this morning. It'll make the breakups in your relationship magnified to a million times. It will make that one argument with someone magnified to a million times. It will make all your past failures so big because you now are angry with God and you feel like you're just a divine joke and all of heaven is laughing at you. You see, I was sick and tired of living between the world and religion. I was so tired, man. Off because I couldn't do either. I didn't fit in. I couldn't be a hypocrite to go to church and be like, hey man, I love Jesus, because I really didn't. And neither could I go in the world and be this superhero. Because in the world you either are a supermodel or a superhero. And I was none. I was neither. I wasn't making an influence. And you know, I wasn't getting any attention either. So I didn't survive in the world and I didn't survive in the church and I felt like there was no place for me. And I'm so glad 
that while I was looking for Jesus in the church, man, he found me out in the streets. <laughs> you know, I was run away from home, and he finds me there. I mean, I grew up in a pastor's house. I grew up in a parsonage. Some of you do not know what that is. It's a church that, it's a house that the church gives the pastor to live in, which is most of the time attached to a church. I lived attached to a church my whole life. And what do you know? I find him on the streets while I'm rolling joints and selling weed. I'm so glad that I found Jesus. Because I realized that Jesus was not in hypocrisy, in religious hypocrisy, and neither was he in the supermodel, super influences of the world. He was in simplicity and authenticity. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? You know that, that sweet spot where you feel so depressed and down and all of a sudden, you're like the Samaritan woman at the well, you come hiding and it's hot and there's Yeshua saying, can I have a drink? And you're like, you asking me for a drink? What's wrong with you, man? You're a rabbi, you're a teacher, I'm a Samaritan woman. And he says, yeah, I've come for you. I come for the broken. I come for the sick. I've come for those who are hungry. I'm so glad that I met Jesus over there. But you know what happened, folks? A few years go by, and now uh, I'm walking with Jesus and I'm loving him. And you know the sick sin, the way it masquerades itself? I see people who used to be like me coming to church, and you know what I do? I begin judging them. And you're like, oh, no, not you, Pastor. I wish I could go back to my ministry years my early years in ministry. I wish I could go back because you see what happened was, listen to me please, what happened was Jesus saved me from the religious bigots and he saved me from the hypocritical world but I thought that to walk with Jesus I had to become like these guys. I had to become like these religious folks. Cut my hair, take my piercings off, go start hating on people. Well, what does the Bible say about long hair? I don't give a rip man. Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so he died for me. So seriously, to hell with your false religion. Amen. Okay, I want to walk with Jesus. But I thought, listen, I thought that, I thought that to be a legitimate Christian, I had to look and smell and talk like these idiots. And you know what happened? Arrogance started to grow in me. And I thought that arrogance was faith. I thought that arrogance was power of the Holy Ghost. I thought that arrogance, being able to rebuke people, was actually the righteousness of God. I thought kicking people out of the church was fighting for the righteousness of God. While well, I said, I will love God and I will love people, but you, sir, have to leave the church. You can't come and dress. Well, I was like that. Well, I looked like them. I spoke like them. I had the same bumper stickers that they had on their motorcycles on mine too. But now I'm like, excuse me, you smell of cigarettes, you can't come. I became like that. Can you believe that? I'm so glad that God picks me up and says, you hateful little bigot, man, come here. I know I saved you, but I'm gonna clean you up and I'm gonna make you a pastor of a church that's gonna be inviting people that don't live like you, don't vote like you, don't look like you, don't live, don't, don't think like you. And I'm gonna show you how much I love people that are so different from you. And folks, what Jesus is gonna to talk to us about is, he's gonna say, hey, listen, man, you're gonna die one day. Are you gonna die in your sins? You're gonna die one day. Are you gonna die in arrogant religious folk? Are you going to die arrogant in your, you know, white nose, flared up nose, angry all the time, looking down on everybody else, hateful comments on social? Is that how you want to die? Verse 21, John chapter 8, recap again. So he said to them, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Now when he says this, it doesn't spark a sense of curiosity, but it only shows the arrogance. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come? He's going to kill himself. Wow, 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 wow. I know in a modern day world, we skim through these verses and we say, I don't see arrogance in that. No, listen to me, man. Do you know how many people out there come to this church, come into your lives on the verge of killing themselves? And if these guys really thought that Jesus was going to kill himself, these are religious folks. They are so flippant. Maybe he's going to kill himself. Hmm. Where he's going, we cannot come. You see, historically, um, the rabbis taught that a person who committed suicide, the worst place in hell was set aside for them. There's absolutely no way a Jew who took his life will find himself in the presence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Suicide was one of the worst sins for them. 
And these guys are actually excited at the thought of Jesus killing himself because he says, wait, I'm going, you cannot come. Look at the arrogance. He's going to go to hell. We're children of Abraham. We're going to be in paradise. Of course we wouldn't be able to go where he is going because he's going to hell and we're not. You see how religion brings a sense of arrogance? You voted for who? And you're a Christian? Wow. So the person I vote for tells you if I'm going to heaven or hell? Interesting. You did what? Wow. And you're a Christian? Huh. So this girl who was sleeping around gives you the right to tell her that she's going to hell. Interesting. Because you're God, right? And, and you know whose reigns are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? Wow, because your religion gives you so much power. You see, arrogance? Oh, because that person was a pastor and he fell. You now are going to go, you know, bring receipts on him all over social media because you are so great and so holy, right? I mean, that's what your religion teaches you, right? Because you're so awesome. You know what I'm talking about? I'm sick and tired of this kind of arrogance in the church, man. I'm sick and tired of people being like, oh, you're a Christian? What denomination? I'm a Presbyterian. Oh, wow. I'm a Presbyterian Baptist. Ooh, even better. I'm a Presbyterian Vegetarian and I drive a Prius. Ooh, man, you know? <laughs> arrogance. Arrogance. I can't believe that some of these pastors even have time to go sit in front of a camera in the, when they're supposed to be having a busy week preparing to, to feed their church and to slander other denominations and pastors. Stop that nonsense. Do you really want to die in such arrogance? Do you know what I'm talking about? And it's quite possible that in today's world, you think that to show your love for Jesus, you have to be arrogant. Like how I thought. Zeal for Jesus meant arrogance. It's not. Because there are people who are dying, man. There are people, Jesus says, I'm going away. These guys, they thought he was going to kill himself. They didn't really care. Earlier, Jesus makes the same statement in John chapter 7, verse 35. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? So initially, they were like, maybe he's going to go to Gentile territory, but now, they're arrogant. See, earlier they were trying to be nice, it seems like. But now they don't really care. Yeah, he's going to kill himself. Now, I told my wife this when I was driving here. I think my main sermon, my main message this morning is just the front and the undertones, really, are the message. I know I can't just talk about suicide and walk past it because I know on social media we're going to get at least a dozen questions. What does the Bible say about suicide? Some of us are still grieving the loss of loved ones, family members, who died because they've taken their life into their own hands. Give me a few minutes. I want to talk about it. Because if you're here, you've been contemplating killing yourself, you've attempted and you've failed, uh, I know what that's like, man. I know what it's like to be in that deep despair and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I've, I've struggled with, I didn't know it was depression. I didn't realize it was this but I've struggled with the sense of just not feeling like I fit in. I don't fit into the world. I don't fit into the Christian circles. And suicide, taking my own life, has gone through my mind multiple different times. And I want to talk to you. Suicide does not keep you away from heaven. Please listen to me. Even your sin does not keep you away from heaven. What keeps you away from heaven is your lack of relationship with Jesus. Those who love Jesus, they sin too. And oftentimes there are those who genuinely love Jesus, they take their irritation, they take their frustration to a place where there's no return. And they take their own lives. I've lost loved ones through suicide and I've had to study this in depth to ask God to give me peace about this. If you had to be perfectly sinless in your works for you to go to heaven, even after you receive Jesus, then you're depending on your works. 
okay? Everybody sins, including a believer, and oftentimes a believer can sin even before they die. And that's why the Apostle Paul writes, what can separate us from his love? Can death, can sickness, can sin? And he says, no, in all this, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Suicide does not separate a believer from Jesus. This does not mean that if you're contemplating suicide, go kill yourself. I'm being very serious about this. Please, don't misunderstand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm with you on this, man. Sometimes I do not know if I'm going to make it through the weekend. No, please don't invite me to go visit your shrink. I don't need that. This is what I'm telling you. You might be struggling with this, but do not numb your pain with goggles and scuba diving tanks to make this world your home. There's a fair chance you're depressed because the Holy Spirit's been telling you over and over and over again, this world is not your home. Look to me. Don't look to numb your pain, but listen to me what I'm talking to you in your pain. C.S. Lewis says it really well. God whispers to you in your pleasures, but he's screaming at you in your pain. Pain is things that we as human beings need to go through, man. You know why? Because grapes, when it's crushed, it's turned into wine. And then it's put in the hands of kings and queens and princes and princesses. If you're going through pain, it's quite possible that God is walking you through the crushing to show you what he's put in you. Don't give up. You might see me over here. I'm nearly 40 years old. And I have a smile on my face. And you know, I go back home and I laugh and I joke. It's not been easy. And sometimes it's not easy. I understand what it's like to be misunderstood. I thank God that you don't have to die with this depression looming over you. You don't have to die with the sin that's been hidden. You don't have to die with arrogant people around you or you being arrogant either. Jesus died for you. He understands you and he wants to have a relationship with you. Let's continue on. Jesus says to them, you are from below. I am from above. You're of this world. I am not of this world. This is a beautiful play on words. You are from below. I am from above. If, this was, if you were speaking in Aramaic, which I think he was, which is like Hebrew, you see, Jerusalem was always up. So wherever you were on the map, whether you are going, you know, Jerusalem is in the south, and even if you're in Nazareth and you're going to Jerusalem, you wouldn't say, I'm going down to Jerusalem. You would say, I'm going up to Jerusalem because it was on a tail, on a mountain. So they would always go up to Jerusalem, and the people in Jerusalem took so much pride because they were up. And Jesus says, I'm from above, you're from below. They're like, no, no, you're from Nazareth. We're from Jerusalem. There's a beautiful play on words with the language when he says, I'm from, I'm from above, you're from below. And before he, they ask, they're confused, he says, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Let me illustrate this again. A lot of illustrations because what Jesus says needs is illustrations. You see, um, I don't know if you could tell, but I am from the Indian descent. I'm of the Indian people, not the dot, not the feather, but the dot. Okay, that kind of Indian. And um, a few years ago, I moved to America, about 12 years ago, I moved to America, and I was still Indian. I had my Indian passport. I had to come through the immigration line and show my Indian passport. And they asked me a bunch of questions. They sent me in. Um, it took me a lot of work to get a driver's license over here and uh, you know, go to the immigration office like every two, three years or something like that and keep renewing my green card. And then two years ago, um, I had the opportunity to, be, to apply to become a citizen of America. And so I applied for that. And they did a huge background check, made sure I had no felonies, uh, just a lot of driving tickets. But they understood I'm Asian. I drive like that, so it's fine. Um, but he's not been in jail. Uh, he looks like a criminal, but he's not. It's fine. And then finally, they invited me to come, and I had to, um, you know, stand over there and make an oath of saying, I will be faithful to this country. When there's a need, I will serve and protect this country. To make an oath of saying, I will live under its rules and laws and regulation and under its constitution. And then they give me the rights to be a citizen of this country. And one of the biggest perks of being a citizen of this country is you get an American passport, which means that when I go to any other country in the world now, I look Indian, I have the Indian accent, but the passport says something different. You see, I was off the Indian origin, born in India, but I'm an American now because something happened. You and I are born in this world. We are, we, we're born dead on arrival. But there's something that needs to happen for you then to be born from above. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. Unless you're born from above, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, unless you're born again, man, you will die in your arrogance. 
unless you really see what Jesus, what I've done for you, what I've come here to do to transform your world, you know, and to tell you that this is not what I've called you to, but I've prepared a place for you, you will die in your arrogance. So the question I want to ask you is, have you learned to avoid your arrogance instead of repenting from it? You keep seeing that, man, you know, I'm happy kind of going to church, being a visitor, but not really becoming a citizen of heaven. Not really saying, you know what, I recognize that I'm off this world, I'm worldly, and I need to give it away. I need to give it up. Because if you continue being worldly, man, your arrogance is going to become your salvation. The more arrogant you are, the more works you do, that's going to be your salvation. And Jesus is warning them, saying, you don't want to die in your sins, you don't want to die in your arrogance. Instead, have the joy of believing in the Messiah. Have joy in living for a higher calling. I'm going to move through this real quickly. Number three. We see the self-righteous arrogance will lie to you. It'll make you foolish. It'll make you laugh at people who are in pain. And then, the worst of all, it's going to make you think that you can face God's judgment by yourself. Don't die having to face judgment. Folks, this arrogance is so crazy, man. This arrogance of religiosity is so insane. It's so cancerous that it will feed you with so much pride that you will actually think that you can face the judgment of God with your chest held high, shake his hand and say, do you know how much I've done? Do you know how much tithe I've given to your kingdom? There are so many people who are arrogant and they think that they can face God's judgment. There are missionaries that come to my door, not Christian missionaries, but from different cults. And one of the questions that I ask them is, if I'm able to show you the truth from the Bible, you bring me your truth that you believed, and I want to show you truth from my Bible. Will you change? Will you become a Christian and go to church with me? And you see the arrogance in their religion. Little kids that laugh at me and say, no. And I was like, so you're brainwashed. If I'm showing you truth, you don't want to believe it. And I asked them, are you ready to face judgment? And the arrogance has brought them to a point of saying, yes, I will face God. I will look him in the eye and I will tell him, I've tried to be a good person. It's like, wow. That's a slap on Jesus' face. And here, we see these guys who think that they are ready to face the judgment. So let's recap again. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. Verse 25, so they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. This who are you is not a question to, to you know, understand. It's questioning with an arrogance. It's like, who do you think you are, man? Who do you think you are? And Jesus tells them, I have much to say about you and much to judge. There's a lot that I want to tell you and there's a lot that I want to judge, but he who sent me is true and I declare to the world what I've heard from him. But they did not understand that he's been speaking to them about the Father. And once again, this lack of understanding is not because there's not enough people to explain to them. It's not because there's not enough resources for them to understand. We have this in our world today. People say, I just don't understand. I just don't understand. It's because they don't have the interest. They don't have the desire to. How many people really honestly believe that they really need Jesus. They cannot live, they cannot breathe, they cannot move without Jesus. How many Christians are like this? He's just something that they add on to in their life. Many people walk around saying, well, I don't really need him. Many of you guys were like that not too long ago. You thought that Jesus was something that you just go attend on a Sunday morning and say before your meals. This lack of understanding does not come because there's not enough preachers, not enough songs, not enough books. Man, there's resources all over the world that you can find to help you see who Jesus is. This lack of understanding comes because of the hardness of heart, because of a lack of desire, a lack of interest, a lack of intimacy, a lack of love. And so then Jesus tells them, when you lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. There's a lot, Jesus says, there's a lot that I want to tell you about you. There's a lot that I want to judge, but the Father's saying, not now, because there's a time coming. Listen to me now. There's a time coming when He will be lifted up and the judgment of the world will be put on Him. And He says, then you will know who I am. And didn't they know? The Roman soldier's on his knees. The Roman soldier's on his knees. Not a Pharisee. A Roman soldier's on his knees. Not a guy who grew up studying the Torah, 
learning Hebrew, not a man who memorized the prophecies, waiting for the Messiah, a Roman soldier's on his knees saying, truly, he must be the Son of God. When the Son of Man was lifted up, everybody, they looked and they said, okay, this truly must be the Son of God. The thief recognized the soldiers of the tomb fell down as dead when the resurrection happened. He appeared to more than 500 people and they recognized that while wow, the judgment of the sin has truly been on him. He truly is the son of God. Pilate's wife is having visions. Pilate is shaking in his boots. When he's lifted up, then you will know who I am because I've come to take away the judgment but you want to die in your sins. You want to die in your arrogance and you want to die thinking that you can face the judge of all judges. And then it says... He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. And that's my hope for us this morning. Many of you are born-again believers. Most of you are. I know that. But if you are born again, I want to ask you, have you learned to function without a fight? If you're not a believer, I want to invite you to the fight. I want to invite you to take this life seriously. Know that this world is not your home, man. Put up a fight and live for Jesus. Surrender to him. Come under his lordship. Let him give you the strength to get through. If you're struggling with depression and suicidal tendencies, man, don't let your own arrogance stop you from finding healing in Jesus. Come to him. Let him heal you. And if you're a religious person over here and you find yourself borderline arrogant like I used to be, repent from that this morning. Don't let the arrogance in your life be avoided. Repent from it. And if you've learned to justify the coming judgment, thinking that, ah, when it's time, I'll deal with it, today is the time to deal with it. Would you please stand? We'll pray and we'll close. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If there's anybody over here that feels like, man, I've been a citizen of the world and I need to, I haven't got my passport to heaven, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to die. I'm still living in my sin. I still recognize my arrogance. And I'm terrified of the coming judgment. I'm not ready to face the judgment. Or I've been uh, lackadaisical about my judgment, but today the Holy Spirit is warning me to pay attention to it. This morning I want you to come to Jesus. I want you to give your life to Him. I want you to make a decision today that you will tell your children about if you live that long of saying, today was the day, man, when I made that decision to say, I'm not going to die in my sins. Some of you, you, you've gone through sicknesses and you feel like your one foot is in the grave already. And I'm so glad that you're able to listen to this. And I want to ask you, are you ready to die? And are you going to be dying in your sins? Are you going to be dying with unresolved relationships with people on this earth because your relationship with your Father in heaven has not been rectified? What is stopping you from showing the grace that you have received from Jesus? Is it because you've never really received His grace? And if that's the case today, would you say, Father, please give me your grace? And maybe you're sitting at home and wondering, how do I do this? How do I live this out? Why do I start and then how do I continue in this? Well, it starts right here by you saying, talking to Jesus directly, saying, Jesus, I recognize that I've been living my way and Jesus, I need you to teach me to live for you. Help me to live for you. And the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. If you don't have a Bible, let me know. I'd love to give you one. And then walk in his ways. For most of you, in fact, the Holy Spirit has been already been convicting many of you of areas of sin in your life that you've learned to adjust around. You've learned to function with that debilitating sin in your life. Put that to an end this morning. And I hope that as you leave these doors, you leave with a sense of awe, knowing that one day you'll be taken out of this world into the home that's been prepared for you. And we will walk, not with arrogance, but we'll walk in simplicity, in humility, and clothed with Jesus' righteousness. Thank you, Father. Thank you. God, I pray for those of us that are living with the goggles of the world on, breathing in the oxygen of this world. I pray that this morning that you would breathe your life into us, that we will no longer live 
like the people of the world do, but we will live differently, Lord, as those who have been washed by your blood. Thank you. Please enable us to live this way and prepare us for the time of death. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, for this warning from your word. Jesus, thank you for being so loving, of speaking so plainly and challenging us and warning us not to die in our sins. So God, we repent this morning. We repent from our sins. We don't want to do them ever again, Lord. We want to put up a fight. God, we don't want to be arrogant. We want to show your grace. We want to show your love. Teach us, Lord, to show your love. Teach us to be humble. And God, thank you for saving us from judgment. Thank you, Father. Your word says that anyone who's come to you has already passed over from judgment into life. We passed from the death into life. We thank you, Father. We rejoice in that. We thank you. We thank you that you took all our judgment on yourself. So now, God, help us to live lives that's worthy of it. We thank you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit give you all the strength that you need to live for him and then to die victoriously for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.